Hello everybody, uh, welcome back to Mastering the Basic Math Facts. We are now up to session 11 and we are looking at our next two final math fact, um, and that being multiply and really divide by 8. Um, so you know the routine by this point, so we're going to jump right over here and take a look at where we've been and where we're heading. Um, so let me zoom in a little bit on this because it's a little hard to read from what you had there. So we began with our foundational facts, our twos, our tens, our fives, our ones, and our zeros, and we know that kids would pick those up at varying rates. Um, and so, but the important thing there, again, building that strong foundation gives them lots of facts that they can reach back into and use as they continue to um, grow in their mastery of their basic math facts. Um, then we moved into our threes, then our fours, then our sixes, our nines, and now we're up to our eights. And so as we think about our eights, we're going to be thinking about how doubling the double and doubling that double works, so double, double, doubles. Um, we'll look at how we can use our fours to find our eights, how we can use our twos to find our eights, um, and just recognizing that there aren't that many new facts at this point for our kids. So as we work our way through uh, this presentation, um, we hope that there are some things that will be beneficial to you in your classroom. Um, and so let's go ahead and jump right into that. Um, so we mentioned, we just mentioned, you know, that doubling is one of the major skills that we began with, right? Our first fact was our twos, and we talked about doubling there. And then when we got to our fours, we said, well, fours are just double doubles, right? And so if fours are double doubles, then we know that eights are double, double, double. So if I can double my, if I'm looking at a value like three, and I say, well, double three is six, well, then double six is 12. So then I know my, I know my eight fact at that point, or I may not um, have it automatic, but at least I have a strategy that I can reach into and work from. So why the eights? Well, we want to make sure we're linking back to what kids already know. We want to attach to existing schema. Um, and we know that at this point, the, the speed and the number of repetitions needed should be less for most kids. So if they've really been building mastery up to this point, now in these last few facts, the number of repetitions isn't um, as many as it would have been back in the beginning. So um, a lot of times it feels like we're spending a lot of time learning those, especially those foundational facts. Um, but again, a good foundation means we get to move a lot faster at this point. Um, Having said that, that doesn't mean that everybody reaches automaticity at the same time, right? So um, we always remember that different kids are going to become automatic with facts at different times, just like for all of us, when learning happens, it's instant, right? Like, oh, now I've got it, I own it, it's mine. Um, a lot of, for some folks, that takes a lot of repetitions. Um, and depending on the content, we're probably all that struggling student somewhere. One of the encouraging things for our kids is we keep looking at our at our charts in terms of our known facts. Um, so once we have our eights, once we own those, there's only one more fact, right? So the only unique fact when we get into our last session is seven times seven, right? So um, in this group, we just had those few, those three new facts for our eights. Um, uh, the big ideas, again, the doubling piece, the double, double, double is one of the big ideas with eights. Um, always coming back to that, um, our number system, in order to make sense of it, in order to really have good number sense, we have to recognize that there are patterns that go on and that those patterns repeat themselves over and over again. Um, and that makes our numbers predictable, right? It makes our answers and our solution strategies predictable. And finally, that the commutative property continues to hold true, right? That the order of the factors doesn't change the product. So even though we're going to be talking about our eights, we're really focusing on seven times eight and eight times eight, because every other factor we've already done at this point. So what are some of those big, those chartable uh, big idea questions? Um, maybe essential questions in some places, right? So um, what patterns do we notice? What's the relationship between our, multi our multiples of four and our multiples of eight? Are the multiples of eight always multiples of four? Um, and what's the relationship between multiples of two and multiples of eight? Um, are all the multiples of 8 multiples of 2? And we can always flip those around, right? We can ask, are all the multiples of 2 always multiples of 8? So I'm you know, getting kids to distinguish between those two is probably a higher level skill for some of our, for most of our kids. And then we talk about double, double, doubles. And why are those multiples of 8 always even? Or are they always even? 
this is just some of those things that can kind of carry us through an extended study of our eights. So our text for um, the eights facts is Snowman at Night, and hopefully this is a story that um, you've experienced before. If not, then um, I think you're in for a little bit of a treat, just kind of the, the funny story of what snowmen do when nobody is watching. So um, as we look at this, um, we're going to have students design their own snowman. Um, and they're going to need to use numbers to describe them. So this could be one of those things you do as a pre-reading uh, exercise that um, kids are going to design their snowman. We're going to talk about how many things like buttons and scarves and pieces to make the nose and the mouth and the eyes and the arms and you know all those just different things that are going to give us a variety of numbers to work with, which um, we know as the teachers, we're going to use those later to say, okay, well, what if I had three snowmen? What if I had five snowmen? So. Um, as we jump into our reading now, and we'll come back here to our after reading exercise in a second. Uh, as we jump over to our book, let me zoom out. I'm a little too far in there. Um, this is Snowman at Night by, by Carolyn Bu Boehner, I believe. Um, and so let's go ahead and go into our story. One wintry day I made a snowman. He was very round and tall. And the next day when I saw him, he wasn't the same at all. His hat had slipped, his arms drooped down. He looked a fright. It made me start to wonder, what do snowmen do at night? I think the snowmen start to slide when it gets really dark. Off the lawn and down the street and right out into the park. They gather in a circle while they wait for all the others, sipping cups of ice-cold cocoa made by their snowmen mothers. Then the snowmen games begin. They line up in their places, each one anxious for his turn in the snowman races. After everybody has a chance at racing once or twice, they go on over to the pond to do skating tricks on ice. Sometimes they start giggling and then they act like clowns. They bump into each other until they all fall down. They gather up their snowballs. The pitcher takes his aim and underneath the moonlit sky they play a baseball game. No one knows just how it started, but soon it's quite a sight with snowmen throwing snowballs in the world's best snowball fight. Of course, then it's time for sledding. It's a wild ride down the hill. Woo! They yell. This is by far the snowman's biggest thrill. Finally, they're tuckered out and getting sleepy, so they slowly gather up their things, and one by one they go. So if your snowman's grin is crooked or he's lost a little height, you'll know he's just been doing what snowmen do at night. So let's look at how we can pull that as a... As a interesting piece of literature, a fun piece of literature in um, to bring in our math facts. So once we get to our after reading part, uh, again, as the teacher, I'm going to draw a snowman and I'm going to make sure that I control some of the numbers on this one. I'm going to say, okay, let's do two pine cones for the eyes, four rocks for the buttons on his shirt, and eight pieces of coal for his mouth. And so with the kids, we're building this, we're drawing it out, we're getting the interest there. Um, and saying, okay, but having just one snowman is not really all that fun. So we saw in the story, they like to play together. So let's build a bunch of these snowmen. What if we had two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, even ten snowmen? How would that change things? And again, they're all going to wear the same thing. They're all going to have two, four, and eight um, as, their, as their numbers of things. And obviously as teachers, we know why that is. Um, kids may not pick up on that right away. And we're going to divide our kids out into nine groups. So we're going to have a little number deck, a number, sorry, a deck of cards for two through ten. Um, so the you two or three kids, you're going to do, you're going to do uh, two snowmen, and you do three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up to ten. So whatever the number is they draw out of the deck, that's how many snowmen their their team is working with. 
And so they're going to take that and draw their snowmen out and write three multiplication equations to show, well, what would the pine cones be? Let's see, there were two pine cones, right? Um, so we're going to have two times however many snowmen I had. If it's the rocks, then I'm going to have four times however many snowmen I had. And if it was pieces of coal, then it would be eight times however many snowmen. Have them do, they're doing that in their groups. We're monitoring as the teachers. Um, we have a sheet for them if it helps here to to kind of hold their information together. They could certainly do this on just a blank piece of paper as well. Um, and then that's going to get us up to this point when we start to pull together more formally. And again, these can happen over a series of days for sure. Um, so once they've got their data and they've got their, their pieces of paper together and they know for if I had four snowmen, then I had uh, eight pine cones, and I had 16 rocks, and I had 12, I'm uh, sorry, 32 pieces of coal, All right? Yeah. Not sure if I got those numbers right. I think I let myself, my mind wander a little bit there, but so you get the point. So if I had double and then if I have four times and I had eight times, whatever my number of snowmen was. Once they have all that, we're going to pull it all together and build the data up. So this could be a big chart on something like the document camera. Um, it might also, or it could be individual for the kids to be working with, and they're going to build their data for twos, fours, and eights, so they have one place they can look at it to compare. And obviously then we're going to ask for some student observations and what kind of observations um, they might come up with. So ideally, they would come up with some things like, well, the number of pieces of coal is always the double the number of rocks. Well, those are eights versus fours, right? And then the number of um, the number of rocks is always double the number of pine cones, and the number of coal is always four times the number. So they're starting to recognize some things, even if they don't pick up on the double doubles or the half 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 relationship that's going on here. Uh, kids are going to need a lot of experiences with doubling, and it's going to need to be hands on. They're going to need to be able to to tactily move some things around um, and then to represent that using pictures and drawings. So we're going to give kids some counters and say, okay, well, let's take out one counter. So lay one counter in front of yourself and how many, and let's double that. So what happens when you have one counter and you double it? Well, you go from one to two, right? And then, okay, so let's go from two, right? So now if I have two, and I double that, what do I get? Well, what, remember, for some kids, we're going to go back to what does doubling mean? That means each one gets another pair. So two becomes four. And then once I have four, when I double that, well, four becomes eight. At that point, then we want kids, oops, back up. we're going to ask kids to fold a paper in four columns and record their record what they find using all their counters. So in that first case, I started with one, right? So one doubles to two, two doubles to four, and four doubles to eight. So that's double, double, double. Uh, but what happens when I start with two and I double two? So we're going to ask kids to, again, I did this in a table here, but they're doing it on just, say, a, a, sheet, a folded sheet of paper or a paper with four columns on it, uh, numbering that first column with where they're starting. So one through ten, and let's double it, double it again, and double it again. Um, and now, again, we're looking at the patterns. For some kids, for a lot of kids, it's helpful if we're covering up so we cover up the, the factors above and below. Um, so if I was looking at five, I might cover up the one through four and the six through ten and say, let's just look at that. Well, what's happening there? Why does five go to ten and ten goes to twenty and twenty goes to forty? So we want the kids to build this table, not providing them with the table. Um, and then how would they describe these using multiplication sentences? So it would be two times the number, four times the number, eight times the number, right? Um, but conceptually, I'm understanding it as double, double, and double. And providing kids with another another way to look at doubling. Um, area models are great for doubling because that's what they show, right? Um, so we have a we we ask the kids to lay out a a two by eight area, right? And so they're going to on their paper uh, get an area that is two by one, two, three, four, five. Oops, I lost my pen. Let's just say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So down to here. It's a little tricky on the screen here. So I've got my two by eight. I'm going to ask the kids to label theirs with two times eight. All right, so they're going to put a two by eight on there so they don't forget. And then they're going to cut theirs out. 
Um, so they cut theirs out, and now we're going to say, okay, well, if I was going to double that, if I was going to make it have double the area of that, um, notice there's a difference between doubling the area and doubling the length and the width, right? That doesn't create a double for us. So um, if I'm going to double the area, well, if this was 16, then I need I need to do one that is right four wide, but still eight long, right? So now I'm not two times eight, but now I am. My lines aren't very straight, but my now I'm not two times eight, but I'm four times eight, right? So here now I'm going to label this as four times eight. The power of this comes as they've cut them out, and again you might want to have a clean one for a document camera. When we lay them on top of each other, it becomes pretty clear that oh, I can kind of see that. Oops, except that I only drew that it's three, didn't I? Should have been one more. Yeah. They can plainly see when you do it correctly. They can plainly see that um, when they're laid on top of each other, that this would be one, right? That would be one two by eight. And then there's another two by eight right beside it. So they can see that the doubling really is a physical doubling of the amount. So it becomes 16 and it becomes 32. And doing this repeatedly with different facts then becomes a way to kind of to um, give students a chance to internalize what does doubling really look like. Um, and again, you could double, double, double with that as well if kids were ready for that. Um, so another way to get kids, uh, to give kids another chance to look at um, how our eights grow, we're going to go back to our zero to 99 chart. Um, we could do eights, we could do any, any, um, any of the uh, values that we've done up till now. So if a kid isn't really ready to do the eights, um, but for the ones who are, we're going to color in the 8s, right? So 8, we could be counting up to get to 16, 24, 32. Some kids are going to see the pattern. Some are, hopefully, you're going to get some that um, recognize the visual pattern. They may not get the number pattern, right? And so when you go over 2 and down 1, right? And you go over 2, down 1. This becomes slope, right, later. Uh, over two, down one, over two, down one. Well, what do I do now? Well, I'm not really sure. Well, that was 40, so where would the next one be? The visual pattern kind of breaks down at that point, right? So we want kids to, they might need to count up and go, okay, well, if I know that 48 is next, now can I use what I did before and go over two, down one? So 56, yep, that seems to work, right? And the key here being that not only are we getting practice with the facts, but we're also getting practice extending beyond just 10 times ten times 8, right? That's going to get us up to 80. Well, what happens when we go beyond our 10s, right? So giving kids lots of experiences is key before we get into building automaticity. Uh, we certainly in the packets have the, or in the, the downloadable resources, have the multiplication facts um, for kids. So they've got their number cards, both multiplication and division. Um, one thing that we add, and you could use this anywhere with the facts, right, is a personal fact log. We saw the fact graph that we that um, was shared earlier with some of the other facts. Um, but, you know, keeping track of on what date, um, how many facts did I, how many facts did I practice tonight, um, or how many facts did I practice in class. Um, those are good for kids to, um, build that level of personal accountability that the amount of practice I put into this matters. Uh, and that uh, for a lot of kids that has to happen at school somewhere. So we have to figure out time to build that into our structures. Right? Uh, another, another way for, uh, for building automaticity is an idea like build missing numbers, right? So kids are going to get a, uh, number cards. Um, they're going to flip over their number card. They're going to write whatever they, whoops, back up one more. Um, so if I flipped over a uh, the digit of um, 3, I could throw that in here over by 4 times 8 is 32, right? Might You could certainly extend it and make it a 30 instead of a 3. That might be more mathematically appropriate. Um, but they're using the digits to complete the sheet, and obviously they're trying to fill in their sheet before um, somebody else fills in all there. So again, you're getting that practice with the multiplication facts. That all the pieces are there. There's always some wild in there as well. Um, another automaticity activity is crazy eights. Um, so again, we're going to shuffle the oops, shuffle our number cards. Um, 
and put them in a pile. They're going to be face down. They're going to flip them over. And they're going to pick a card and multiply it by 8. So if I pick the 4, again, I'm going to multiply 8. Oops, too far. I'm going to flip over the 4. There we go, sorry. Um, I'm going to, if I flipped over the 4, I'm going to say 4 times 8 is 32. I get to color in that part on my crazy 8. And uh, if, the car, if it's already covered, then you don't get one that turn. So you want to uh, try to fill up your card. So it's, again, it's just repeated practice with our multiplication facts. Summing up the facts is a good way to get in a little review of addition as well. Um, so we're going to shuffle up the times 8 fact cards. So we've got all those here. You could certainly mix in the division facts if kids were ready for that. Um, they're going to select a card. They're going to find the product and write it down on their sheet. Oops, I don't have my... I guess I didn't put the sheet in here, but um, they're going to record their uh, the what they got. So if you're doing division, maybe they're recording the larger value, not the, well, I guess they could record whatever. Uh, it would be the same as long as you were consistent and were giving everybody the division cards or the multiplication cards. So if you're doing multiplication, so if I flipped over 8 times 8 and I can answer that that's 64, well, then I get 64 points, right? Um, so after four rounds, I'm going to add up my total. So I'm trying to get the bigger ones, which are, as teachers, those are usually the ones we're trying to get the kids to practice because those are usually the ones they're struggling with. Um, but you could flip it around and you don't, and just do the, the um, you could go for the smallest total if you wanted to do that. Um, and you don't have to put all the cards in all the students' decks, right? Um, so if a student really isn't ready for the higher facts, they could just have the facts of up through 8 times 5. Um, so if that's what they are need to practice on. And that kind of brings us into, um, as we get ready to switch over to the division part, as teachers we have to be cognizant of the, the reality that creeps up on kids. The more they're, especially the more they're struggling, the more anxious they may become. We've done a lot in this um, to de-emphasize the role of time tests, right? Um, but even with that, if I'm if I'm a student and I have some math anxiety, which can be very real for kids, um, that if I if I am that child and I realize that other kids are making more progress than I am, uh, there's a classroom culture piece there that we've got to work with. We also have to recognize that um, that this is very real for a child, and sometimes we have to back off a little bit and say, okay, well, let's just, just work on a few of the facts that you need to, to get better on, and let's keep that fact log, right? Let's, let's document that we're practicing, because um, if kids can recognize that, oh, I'm not practicing and I'm not getting better, then they start to realize there is power in that practice, um, and maybe they're more likely than to practice. Confidence on, generally only grows through success, right? So repeatedly pointing out to kids that they're struggling really doesn't help them, and it probably just frustrates us as the teachers as well. So as we move into the last little bit here with division, um, spiders and octopus and anything that has eight legs um, is fun for kids. Um, good connection to division because now we can present, well, I have, I have 72 legs, right? Um, or I can see 72 legs, so how many spiders do I have? Um, so they call this spider division, right? Um, so some kids are going to need manipulatives and models. Some kids are going to think of it as, well, what times 8 gives me 72, and that's okay. Um, but we need to give them that practice. Um, using the, the division cards is one way to get there as well. Don't forget the, uh, the triangle cards are a good way to always practice division as well. Spaces uh, work similarly, right? So kids are going to start all of them on a start, and this is a game for probably pairs, maybe three, three, four would be really pushing it on a board like this. Um, so they're going to spin their spinner, right? They're going to find their quotient. So 24 divided by 8 is 3, so that means I get to color in the 3. Um, then once I'm on that 3, the next time I spin, so here's my little, my little chip is on the 3. The next time I spin, I have to get something that would give me an answer of 1, 2, 8, or 6. Otherwise, I can't move. So I don't get to pick wherever I want to go. I can only go to, a, to an adjacent square. So eventually what I'm trying to do, right, is get down to the... Um, I'm trying to get down here to the 8. Some kids might go all around the board to get there. It just depends on what you spin. Uh, there's definitely a an element of chance here, and that's intentional, right? It's just give us lots and lots of practice um, with our division facts. We will remind, again, as we get to the end here, that we really want this to be meaningful for you. So hopefully there's a few of these things that 
you'll say I'm using that add it to a folder make it make some file folder games for your kids um, you may not be able to use it this year maybe something that you use next year that's perfectly fine if you have resources that you are using please share those through our Edmodo group um, we'll be moving not next to eight next sorry we'll be moving um, we'll be moving over to seven right so after we do that seven fact that'll be our last one um, we'll do a little bit of review in that session and uh, close up this professional development. So we will see you soon for that last session.